Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 252 at block height 666,497 on Sunday, January 17th. So, Janine, how long are you going to make it before you start giggling? Uh, well, today is Johnny Mnemonic Day for anyone who doesn't know and isn't plugged into Cyberter. Uh, movie based on Gibson novel was released in 1995 and there is a screen in the beginning of the movie that kind of gives the date 17th of January 2021 interestingly enough um, the movie correctly predicted <laughs> that there would be a pandemic <laughs> at this time um, but the day of the week on the screen is actually wrong it said it would be Thursday and obviously it is Sunday Alternatively, this is proof that we are in a parallel universe. Um, I don't know when that would have cut off, but uh, yeah. The simulation glitched. Maybe it isn't Sunday. Maybe it really is Thursday. Yeah, so I actually checked what day of the week it was when uh, Y2K happened, but I think that was a Saturday or something, so that was not that conspiracy theory ended there. No, it didn't. The government is clearly lying to us about the calendar. Well, I just, I find it hilarious because imagine you are one of the producers of this film and like, you're like, yeah, it's not, not going to be, de- gonna be a big deal what day of the week it is for this random date that I put on the screen. It might be a big deal <laughs> about the pandemic, but come on, I'm not going to be right about that. And then they end up being right about the thing that no one was really thinking about. <laughs> Meanwhile, you can predict what day of the week it is obviously hundreds to thousands to millions of years in advance priorities but anyway um yeah i think there's a story that we need to talk about that is really hilarious Mm -hmm. and has all kinds of life lessons wrapped up in it yeah unfortunately i think we should uh apologize to our audience in advance um i i i mean it, it sounds to me, based on the tweets I've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, um, the product that we're about to talk about is probably not something they would use anyway because a lot of our listeners don't have girlfriends. <laughs> Burn. Alrighty. So, there is an electronic internet connected chastity belt for your penis called cellmate made by a Chinese company that back in October of 2020 was found to have a lot of uh, vulnerabilities exposed in their API that could allow someone to compromise the device and leave the wearer unable to open it. Obviously, somebody had to make some Bitcoin ransomware for this internet connected cock cage and start locking them on people demanding around 0.02 Bitcoin to unlock the chastity cage. Wait, just 0.02? That's very low. I I think they're underestimating how badly uh, guys would want to get that cage open. Now, now here is here is the funniest part of this. Um, verbatim, one of the victims was told, according to the creator of the ransomware, "Your cock is now mine." 
What's the name? Uh, I didn't almost hear the name of the company again that makes it. Cellmate. Um, it's by oh. uh, Qui, uh, Q-I-U-I. Yeah, so for a second when you said it, I heard Celebrate, which is so much worse. And I was like, seriously, are you... first of all, I didn't even know. But yeah, that's where my brain went. Obviously, you should never give anything, let alone your dick, to Celebrate. Mm-hmm. So, what would you say is the first life lesson to be learned from this ransomware incident? Not your keys, not your cock. (laughs) Internet of shit meets internet of dick. (laughs) I just can't get over this. Um, We live in 2021. The year where someone over the internet can hack your penis yeah i mean i don't uh i do i do not want to be on that phone call when that person is either attempting to break the cage somehow without also cutting off their dick um or calling police trying to get them to investigate (laughs) the situation i just can't get out of my head right now what all of these victims feelings towards bitcoin must be like right now (laughs) <laughs> like how, how many people's first encounter with bitcoin beyond hearing it in the news was getting their penis hijacked <laughs> you could say they've been cock blocked <laughs> oh man not very not not very good for digestion Let, let's just say um yeah um, ransomware is still a thing, and yeah, um, it's gonna get really weird if this is an indication of the type of shit that people start thinking about attacking. Cause yeah, no matter how many times the experts and security researchers point out the Swiss cheese holes all over Internet of Things products. They're still popping up everywhere. You know what I think would be a, a great move? I think we should recommend that John McAfee um, uses this device. And we can say, you know, if you really believe in the power of McAfee antivirus software, you should, you know, that, that will keep the ransomware off, right? So if you believe in the power of McAfee antivirus, put that on the device so that it can't be ransomware. But if it fails then he has to actually uh, keep his promise that he made about cutting off his dick. I feel like that's letting him slide. That's that that's that's letting him escape from the former obligation. Well it's kinda of, it's kind of a trick uh suggestion because obviously antivirus software is virus software. It's just not the kind that hopefully will lock your dick in a cage. Yep. We said the D word too much for YouTube content to uh, label this episode anything but explicit. Well, it was inevitable. So we, we, we got all the jokes out, right? I think. Probably. I'm sure I will think of more. <laughs> Alrighty. So what is up with Bitcoin Core? Well, the uh, lead maintainer... Uh, Vladimir Vandalon on January 14th released uh, the final candidate for version 0.21, which we've all been waiting for because it has a ton of things. Um, Also, magic number 21. Um, In the announcement uh, email, which, by the way, he's still using the same PGP key to sign these releases, but the email that he sent it from was actually ProtonMail this time, and he explained that below the tweet from the Bitcoin Core Project Twitter account that it's just that he's, you know, migrating to ProtonMail, but it's the same PGP, so you know it's him. Uh, He writes, this release adds support for Tor version 3 hidden services and rumoring them over the network to other peers using BIP 155. Version 2 hidden services are still fully supported by Bitcoin Core, but the Tor network uh, managed by the Tor project will start deprecating them in the coming months. The Tor onion service that is automatically created by the um, 
list, uh, listen onion configuration parameter will now create a Tor v3 service instead of a Tor v2. The private key that was used by Tor v2, if any, will be left untouched in the onion underscore private key on, or onion underscore private underscore key file in the data directory and can be removed if not needed. Uh, Bitcoin Core will no longer attempt to read it. Um, the private key for the Tor v3 service will be saved in a file named onion underscore v3 underscore private underscore key, blah, blah, blah. Just more details about how to, you know, still keep using Tor v2 services if you need to. Um, but yeah, now there's v3. Um, and also, as expected, this release, quote, implements the proposed taproot consensus rules uh, according to BIP 341 and 342, but without activation on mainnet yet. Um, this is the Tor slash Schnorr soft fork that we've been talking about for a couple of years now. Um, obviously not activated. The code is just there. And uh, yeah, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, it feels like, you know, been quite a long time for some I, I guess a lot of people haven't really heard about Tor or Schnorr until this year um, but yeah we've been talking about it I think at least since 2018 2019 indubitably I'm also really psyched though about the uh, the descriptor wallets functions and compact block filters yeah so other other changes include support for signets based on BIP 325. Um, when you're using real Bitcoin in the wild, that is on mainnet. Um, when you're using testnet or signet, you are in a controlled environment where you can try out new features or operations without fear of causing trouble on mainnet or losing real Bitcoin in the event that there are errors somehow. Signet is what you would use to test out Taproot and Schnorr until it is activated on a mainnet if you have the knowledge, experience, and desire to do so. And yeah. Yeah, that I think is going to be <clears throat> pretty big for developers because Testnet is just a random shit show with blocks spitting out rapid fire and then none coming, trolls playing reorg games. Like, it's a complete unpredictable shit show that will you know give a much more stable environment for devs to test stuff in and not have to sit around and, and wait for somebody to point hash rate at it yeah and regarding the uh descriptor wallets that you mentioned um that's uh the one of the things linked in the show notes is an older blog post from andrew chow that i had previously included in the october issue of my Bitcoin privacy newsletter, and it concerns wallet-related changes specifically to um, make the transition from key-based legacy wallets to script-based descriptor wallets. Um, he wrote, in contrast with legacy wallets, descriptor wallets are designed to support the Bitcoin scripting system through the use of descriptors, uh, which explicitly give an output script and thus address, as well as all of the keys and scripts necessary to sign them. This essentially means that the descriptor wallets are a script-based wallet, while leg legacy wallets are key-based. A descriptor wallet will then be able to support any kind of descriptor. Newly introduced descriptors for new script types can be easily added to the wallet by adding a new descriptor. For example, the Taproot proposal introduces a new address type and output scripts. These can be easily added to the Bitcoin Core wallet by implementing a new descriptor. So it just makes it easier to adopt new script types. That also is pretty fucking huge. And not, not just from the sense of, um, whatchamacallit, like new address types like Schnorr, but like let's say you know, you wanted to make some wonkadoodle custom script. Um, <laughs> it'll be a lot easier to actually track such things. Now, the question is, when will the argument over when Taproot activates start? <laughs> um, well, I believe we're still at the stage where everyone is kind of waiting for an argument to happen. But so far, all we've gotten is low level FUD like Taproot won't work if it's not adopted. Well, I guess we're going to see if some goofball out there decides to just take uh, 0.21, um, turn Taproot on, and start playing UASF games. Yep. Oh, here, here for another fucking 
massive release with new things for Bitcoin Core. But what is happening in a city in my least favorite U.S. state? Least favorite? Actually, actually, no, New York is probably my least favorite. So, yeah. Um, the mayor of Miami um, <laughs> has been uh, talking for a little bit about trying to make Miami a friendly environment for um, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin companies and activities. And uh, <clears throat> went on um, Fox Business on the 14th, I think. And he kind of let slip that he is considering putting some of the city of Miami's investment fund directly into Bitcoin in addition to trying to create um, regulations and city ordinances to make it more friendly to use. And, and in that regard, he's talking um, also about like transactional use cases for retail payments and things like that and trying to clear red tape out of the way. But um, yeah, um, this is absolutely mind blowing to me. Um, and as far as Miami specifically, I am not quite sure of their budget situation and relation to the state or federal levels, but generally big cities a lot of the times wind up having dependencies on funds from their state or you know, sometimes if they're really bad at fiscal management funds from the federal government. And this is just really interesting and crazy to me because if the mayor were to actually follow through on this and put a bunch of city funds in Bitcoin and Bitcoin tears off to the moon, um, like it seems to be in the middle of right now, that could really alter depending on their current budget situation um the dependence they have on the state or the federal level um to actually fund the city and the services it provides so that's really kind of fucking crazy yeah i mean um i mean i don't know about the rest of you but there is pretty much nothing that would make me want to move to Miami long term. In fact, isn't there there is like this really shitty show that we watch that the whole the storyline was like, oh, no name woman developer makes a cryptocurrency that sounds a lot like Bitcoin but is actually really shit because it's centralized. Like they don't understand the the fundamental aspects of bitcoin at all and they were trying to portray it as like oh dark net market bad but you know i can't remember the name of that show is really bad but i'm pretty sure it took place in florida um i can't remember which city but yeah i don't i wouldn't nothing would make me want to move to florida ever wait i'm sorry did you just call startup a bad show that was one of yeah. the funniest comedies I've ever watched in my life. That was not meant to be a comedy. <laughs> I think I, I think I even tweeted about how bad it was when, very a long time ago. I might have to look up what I said. But no, like seriously though, like think about it for a minute. Like, look at the wider kind of political shit show that America is in the middle of right now. Um, states are not very fond of the federal government, vice versa. You have this weird dynamic where a lot of major cities kind of have to bounce between their state and their federal government to actually have a budget that works. And um, now this major city's mayor is talking about buying Bitcoin with city funds. Like that, that quite literally is a potential escape hatch for major cities in this country to just be more self-sufficient in terms of the funding that they need for their city budget. And just, okay, state government, federal government, fuck you both. You guys play your stupid games. Um, we've just exited it. 
Yeah, so I just, uh, I looked up what I said in January, oh wow, so only two days off, January 15th, 2017, I said, watching startup and an investor mentioned offhand that the better than Bitcoin gen coin is closed or script writers, come on now. And then I also linked to a review from Brady Dale, who is a now a Coindesk writer, and he, um, he said that the show should be renamed to Buzzwords Between Bedsheets. God, it was hilarious! Actually, no, I said that it should be renamed to that, but he said that's a sign of what it's about. Yeah, so. I mean, come on, are you seriously trying to tell me that a TV show with a magic centralized cryptocurrency with an AI powered algorithm to control inflation so that there's inflation, but it doesn't break everything is not supposed to be a comedy. Like, come on, come on, Janine. It's that the best comedy has, ever. That also has more anonymity than Tor. I think that was another claim. <laughs> but like for real Z's Janine, um, this is a crazy thing that could just wildly change the political dynamics of the U.S. if a bunch of major cities start doing this. Like, that this completely would change the way that major cities interact with state and federal governments. And, like, that's just fucking bonkers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess from that, I mean... I don't really want any government to have Bitcoin, but I guess it's a step in the right direction to have at least a somewhat more local government to have the Bitcoin instead of the feds. But uh, yeah, uh, Miami would never be on my list, <laughs> no matter what they do. Well, let's see what other cities start talking about this over the, uh, the next uh, half of this year. If if Florida gets some decryption magic dolphins, maybe I'll think about it. <laughs> Speaking of other states in the U.S., though, um, yeah, the state of Kentucky on the 12th um, put a draft bill to the General Assembly uh, to create tax incentives for Bitcoin miners. Um, and specifically... Um, pretty much exempting them from a 6% sales or excise tax on any electricity or equipment bills um, used in a mining operation. And th this looks pretty much to me like um, this exemption was carved out um, a long time ago for things like schools or any kind of industrial manufacturing business to kind of give them tax breaks and incentives to, um, one, in the case of a school, um, be more budget efficient, and in the case of manufacturing businesses, kind of just incentivize them to operate in Kentucky. And um, yeah, this bill um, put to the General Assembly by, I think, uh, who were they? Um, Stephen Rudy and Chris Freeland um, would pass all those tax benefits on to Bitcoin miners. So you would not be paying taxes on your mining equipment, any purchases made through that, um, any networking equipment, cables, power supplies, and any of the physical equipment needed to mine, and the electricity that you are purchasing from the utility to mine. So that on top of already kind of cheap electricity prices, um, like this could really start drawing a... A decent amount of miners to Kentucky and you know it's we, we're starting to kind of see that acceleration of individual states inside of the US starting to think let's attract this money to our state rather than some other state and yeah um, kind of just got a call back to the current political dynamic going on right now and it's just the more and more I see these types of things, the more and more I see states or cities or what have you looking to establish more independent revenue related to this space. And like I, I cannot look at that and not see these governments just trying to be more independent from the layers of governments above them. Like I, I 
don't see why else th th this kind of action and, and attitude would be propagating all over the place like this. See, this is much better news from my perspective because one, Kentucky horses. Um, two, uh, yeah, it's much better than the Miami situation, in my opinion, uh, from you know the perspective of you know Miami mayor saying you know we're going to use your tax money to buy Bitcoin that we will hold. Not that interesting to me from an individual perspective, but Kentucky saying we will allow you to mine Bitcoin and be tax exempt as a miner. For certain things um that's a much better scenario for me i'm just like i just look at this country and i see snow crash coming and bitcoin is the road that's going to take us there so how about some wild government news from another part of the world more governments getting into bitcoin uh yeah so the provincial government of Khyber, uh, I'm, I'm going to completely butcher this, um, Pakhtunkhwa, um, one of the four provinces in Pakistan, um, has launched two state-owned um, Bitcoin mining farms. And to kind of give some context for this, um, this province has been kind of lobbying the national government um, for quite a while to do things like this, um, to clarify and legalize um, Bitcoin use and ownership in the country and do things like mining uh, for a while now. And so this province kind of passed bills clarifying those things and established these two mining farms themselves. Um, and they've gone so far, um, according to the article I'm looking at with the bill, um, pretty much clarifying that individuals are allowed to launch and issue their own cryptocurrencies legally. So, yeah, <laughs> um, there is now, um, <laughs> in addition to in that region, Iran, um, pretty much setting themselves up as the only people miners there can sell Bitcoins to. Um, a provincial government in Pakistan directly mining Bitcoin themselves. So, uh, yeah, um, I think we are unequivocally, undeniably at the point where nation states are jumping on board as actors in this system, and that is going to be part of the incentives. <laughs> Get some Bitcoin before your government takes it all. I have never heard better advice. All right. I think we do have one more mining story to go. So this, um, I am honestly not sure how I feel about this. But Poolin, um, the second largest Bitcoin mining pool, um, is launching a hash rate token. So effectively, um, the TLDR of this is they are doing cloud mining, except marginally better than it was before. Um, so, so they have issued a ERC-20 token um, backed by hash rate that Poolin directly operates themselves. And the improvement here is that they specifically um, peg these tokens to both um, a um, hash rate unit and a power efficiency. So in the case of this token they're launching now, um, PBTC35A, um, each token represents one terahash a second of hashing power at 35 joules per terahash efficiency. And pretty much the idea here is just like cloud mining. Um, you buy one of these tokens, um, they mine for it, and minus the electricity costs and a 2.5% fee from pooling, um, pass all of the rewards on to you. Now, the only reason that this is... Uh, I would say better than past cloud mining setups is the fact that they specifically tie that hash rate to an exact electricity efficiency 
and make this a lot easier to audit um, in the sense of look at what is actually operating um, according to the outstanding tokens, look at the network difficulty, look at how much you are actually gaining um, in revenue from holding these tokens and kind of make sure that, you know, what was advertised is what you're getting. And they've also set this up so that um, you can pretty much stake this in an ETH smart contract in um, collect wrapped Bitcoin, um, as well as earn governance tokens for what they're calling the Mars protocol on this smart contract. And effectually, er, effectively build up um, a liquidity pool for this. Now, they are currently, um, when this article I'm looking at was written, selling 100 USDT per, per terahash. Um, that's a $30 markup from the $70 it would cost to actually buy an Antminer S19 and simply operate that. Um, per terahash. So, yeah. Um, really, all I see here is just more cloud mining that is a lot more transparent than it has been previously. But this, um, yeah, I, I still just kind of see this as the hardware operator trying to pass on the risk and volatility to other people and safely collect a margin off the top for that. So yeah, uh, I'm not really sure what I, I feel about this. Um, on one end, um, I think that things like that are kind of greasy personally, but on the other hand, this is accomplishing that type of business model with a lot more ability to publicly audit that and call them out if things are being misrepresented. So yeah, um, I'm betting a lot more mining pools and mining operators are going to start doing shit like this. Boo. Alrighty. So I think during the extra long um, gap between the last show, um, Tor had some pretty big hiccups. Yeah. So if you were, if you are or were a Tor user like me on January 10th, uh, starting around then, you may have noticed that the network was having some issues and it appears that this was caused by, um, well, one of the linked issues was uh, basically a long thread about an ongoing denial of service attack on directory authorities. And it looks like that may have intensified. I haven't really checked, um, but there was basically some consensus issues between the directory authorities. There's currently nine of them, uh, and this fluctuates a little bit from year to year. At one point, I think there was like 11 of them, and lowest point was like eight. So sometimes, um, yeah, basically they're just responsible for uh, making clients and relays aware of other relays so that you know you can use tor and if you went to something like consensus health at the tor projects website you would have seen uh, during this um, disruption there was warnings for some of the directory authorities that they were not in consensus and what ended up happening is that there was an implementation bug with the new um, version 3 onion services that led them to be unstable uh, in the face of these consensus issues. Um, basically, they said because unlike the existing prior version 2 onion services, these ones uh, wouldn't publish descriptors and the clients wouldn't fetch them. So basically, you just weren't able to use the, the new v3 ones. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen them discuss anything about whether the denial of service was specifically targeting the v3 um it seems like at this point it's just a side effect of the consensus issues that were already happening against the directory authorities but it's possible that uh the timing of it may have also been related to the increasing use of v3 
yet. This kind of brings up in my mind the issue of how solid a lot of these privacy tools infrastructure is. Because, I mean, it's like j just in general, um, you know, journalists, political activists, like numerous people have counted on Tor to protect them or protect themselves and keep themselves private. And now even a, a huge number of uses of Bitcoin are coming to depend on that more and more. But, you know, there are still these central directory servers that can get slammed and attacked. And then the whole thing starts having systemic issues. Like on top of just all kinds of denial of service attack factors that exist in that, like... You, you, Tor really needs to kind of get the ball rolling on implementing things like the the token schemes or proof of work hashing schemes that they've been looking at lately to address these issues a lot more fundamentally. Because, like, yeah, I mean, one attack on the consensus directories here, and that took all of these hidden services down due to a tiny bug in it. Like, that's. That, that is such a huge point of failure in so many things on the internet. Which is part of the reason why there is a lot more exploration into mesh networks. Um, but yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, Tor, I mean, the relays are not centralized. They are pretty dispersed, although there is obviously a large uh, amount of them in Europe and particularly Germany. Um, but yeah, the, the Tor network is at best a distributed network because the consensus process relies entirely on these directory authorities, which at this point there's nine of them. And considering the fact that the people who run these directory authorities, a lot of them are known by name and a lot of them know each other. And I haven't checked how many of them directly work at the Tor project. Um, there's at least, I mean, I mean, there's Roger Dingledine who does. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, you know, like I said, at best distributed, but more linked towards centralized when you consider the actors who are actually running them. Uh, there's kind of a concentration there. You know, I really think like, like Tor needs to look at kind of like how, how the hell do you deal with the potential for malicious nodes without having this ridiculously centralized directory service like you know what what kind of alternatives are there for reputation for you know rating any individual you know relay node that you want to route something through that kind of get rid of the central point of failure or you know even if you can't get rid of it like try to spread that around more because i mean i don't know like when i saw that happen um especially in the wider environment of stuff going on right now on the internet with big service providers and companies like that was kind of just like a if if somebody really wanted to Bye-bye, Tor. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't be that hard. I don't even know. I haven't looked into whether anyone has theories about where this uh, where this denial of service attack was coming from. Um, all, all I saw in the, uh, the reports on the issue in the repo were just some external um, actor that was not a part of the Tor network. Like, yes, yeah. what is another story about the risks of centralized things and how easy they are to shut down? Well, um, hmm. so dark market, um, from my understanding, um, the largest outstanding dark net market at the time, um, had around half a million users uh was shut down and busted by german police on the 12th and uh yeah a couple of interesting things here um 
one, the initial press release was immediately able to document the amounts of currency um, held or processed, as well as the number of transactions that had been processed on the market. So that immediately tells me that they probably owned everything um, running on the market. But um, yeah, that was around 4,600 Bitcoin and 12,800 Monero um, seized. And to kind of put that in perspective, um, hold on, let me find the math again. Um, but yeah, that's um, less than uh, around 2% of that market's volume was done in Monero. If you look at the uh, dollar values at the time and um, dark dot fail um, a uh, person who pretty much is constantly looking at tour and things going on there um, for journalistic reasons um, said apparently dark market ran on a boilerplate um, PHP script that was operating mm. <laughs> the entire marketplace. Um, so yeah. Um, add that to the enormous list of reasons why buying drugs on the internet is really fucking stupid because, Hey, when you, you know, you, you send your, your address off encrypted, you know, to some guy to ship you drugs there. What, what, what is the infrastructure holding that? What is the, uh, you know, the back end software, like how, how sound is that, you know, was that written by the operators? Is that just, um, some thing floating around from marketplaces past that somebody grabbed and spun up? Um, who knows? But uh, yeah. You well, know, it, so one thing. Go ahead. It, it, it's just kind of amazing to me that <laughs> something like this was just running on PHP. Yeah, so one thing I want to point out in relation to kind of this story and the last one, because they're both uh, sort of tour related. Um, I watched an interview that Michaela Peterson did with um, someone who works at like a victim advocacy organization, specifically people who have been targeted with like revenge porn or their sexual abuse or assault survivors. And the topic was about Pornhub and, and what was the kind of ethics and legitimacy of, you know, networks like visa cutting them off and such and the first guest was uh like i said she was part of a kind of victims advocacy organization and there was a point where she made this claim that like oh did you know pornhub runs a tor onion service um obviously everyone knows that you know the only content on tor is illegal and i probably don't have to tell our audience this because they already know but in case you don't um no the Tor network is not just for accessing illegal content. In fact, you can use the Tor network to access all of the regular things that you usually use and you never have to touch an onion service if you don't want to. Tor is just a way of anonymizing your connection to that service. And if you use an onion service, then not only is your IP address masked to them, but their true location and IP address is masked to you. That's the only difference. The fact that there is illegal content that you can find on the Tor network is true, but you can also find tons of illegal and disgusting content on the surface web, which is what you are using. And in fact, there is probably more of it on the surface web than on the Tor network. So yeah, I just wanted to clear that up because I am sick and tired of hearing that the Tor network, especially because I have to give a presentation on privacy in the next couple of days and I assume that that audience will probably also know this but I will ha explain it anyway because I'm sick of this misconception that the only content you can access through the Tor browser is illegal content because that's just kind of proof that you've never literally used Tor ever um, because if you do <laughs> you would open it up and you would 
if you open the Tor browser, you would see a DuckDuckGo search engine, which you can use without having the Tor browser, by the way. And you can go to whatever website you want. There may be some difficulties accessing it because unfortunately some websites are stupid with their policies and often block Tor connections. Um, a lot of it due to the stupid misinformation from people like this woman in this interview. Um, but yeah, just thought I would mention that. Yep. And now you go to the gulag. I go to the gulag? See, off with you now. Does the gulag at least have canned corn? No. No canned corn. Damn it. Do I have to wear IoT chastity belts? Only if you have a penis. Oh, well then, good me. Alrighty then. So... Who had another oopsie they just found out about? Yeah, so in uh, July and December, and probably some points in between that, I covered the data breach of customer information from the e-commerce and marketing databases used by Ledger, and over 1 million email addresses and 272,000 shipping orders were dumped on raid forums last month. Um, they have since been informed of further leaks through Shopify. Uh, in their post, they say, now we have new information to share. On December 23rd, which is actually before they made their last major announcement about, uh, that was actually before, I think, raid forums uh, came up. Um we received a notification from our e-commerce provider Shopify regarding an incident involving merchant data. In fact, that uh, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Regarding an incident involving merchant data in which rogue members of our support team obtained customer transactional records, including ledgers, agents illegally exported customer transactional records in April and June 2020. According to Shopify, this is related to the incident reported in September 2020, which concerns more than 200 merchants, but until December 21st, uh, Shopify had not discovered that Ledger was also targeted in this attack. Shopify tells us that they engaged in digital forensics. Ex they engaged digital forensics experts and counsel to continue their investigation on the matter and have reported to law enforcement in both Canada and the U.S. Along with forensic firm. Orange Cyber Defense, we were able to establish that it affects approximately 292,000 customers. While the database is 93% similar to those exposed in the previous attack, there were approximately 20,000 new customer records, including email, name, postal address, products ordered, and phone number included in this breach. Yeah, so um, luckily for the 93% of people included in this breach who were breached before, um, congratulations, you are still affected but not newly affected. For the other 7% uh, who were not included in the first breach, you are now in the club, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, so uh, Ledger uh, in the same post, is offering a bounty fund of 10 Bitcoin for information leading to the successful arrest and prosecution of whoever is behind this. Uh, and once again, um, as I've always included in my Bitcoin privacy newsletter, when it comes to topics like this with data breaches, if you know or suspect that you are impacted by this, there are a few resources that I would recommend you look at. First of all, if you're mobile phone number was included in the dumped data and it was your main phone instead of a throwaway burner phone um, and you maybe are storing passwords or other kinds of sensitive access keys to important accounts on it, you should read something like Kraken's Security Advisory Mobile Phones. Uh, that, that's the title of the post, Security Advisory colon Mobile Phones. If your name or residence address was included in the dumped data, then you should read something like Jameson Lopp's A Home Defense Primer and A Modest Privacy Protection Proposal. If you are being contacted, harassed, or threatened by anyone, especially if they are explicitly doing so in relation to this breach and the fact that you they think you have Bitcoin, whether you do or not, you should listen to episode 200 of privacy, security, and OSINT show, which is, uh, I don't know if I pronounced his name correctly, but Michael 
Bazell, who some of you might already know is the author of a book called Extreme Privacy. Uh, I do have to mention he is a former uh, government uh, employee. In fact, he worked for the FBI on computer crime. So maybe if you are worried about that in terms of using his services, like he offers uh, uh, services to not only take down, you know, sensitive information about you from websites, whether you've been attacked or not, but he also uh, helps you with setting up, you know, anonymous accounts, with uh, setting up, um, bu buying homes or getting hotel rooms, and obviously all kinds of things uh, if you're feeling unsafe or want to increase your security. But maybe you wouldn't be interested in that if you know that he used to work for the FBI. But anyway, the episode is through a bunch of different podcast outlets, so you don't have to worry about that to listen to a podcast. Um, but he gives lots of good advice about what to do if you're being stalked, doxxed, or harassed online or in person. And he even specifically mentioned the Ledger data breach, so he's aware of that situation. Are people still going to be able to listen to that? I thought podcasts were about to get regulated. Well, on the scale of or yeah, on the scale of podcasts that are likely to get shut down first, I feel like his would be probably at the low end of possibility because not only has he worked for the government before, but he uh he keeps it family friendly. Uh and yeah. But yes, apparently podcasts are the new outlet for extremism because journal a bunch of journalists have figured out that you can send audio to people, and that is very, very dangerous. You hear that, punks? You might be extremists. Alrighty, so, fuck Ledger. Um, holy shit. Anything else to say? Well, I mean... It would be interesting to see, because I haven't looked to see whether there has been like a major increase in data breaches related to e-commerce stuff. So I don't know whether the Shopify incident, I mean, maybe maybe this whole attack against Ledger was like a big facet of a larger attack that is occurring just against getting people's personal information and purchase history. Um, there could be a number of reasons why various actors would want that. Um, yeah, so I hope that, uh, you know, well, the other, basically any business in the space uh, who does similar kinds of, you know, you ship things to, physical things to people, or especially if you don't ship physical things to people and somehow, for whatever reason, you are still demanding that customers give you personal information like shipping address when you don't need it, um, you should reconsider that right away and you should protect any information like that that you do have because you will look like a monumental idiot if you become another Shopify. Yep. Well, ah, man. I am sad inside. So BitMax is continuing down the road of further cucking themselves after Arthur Hayes and others were indicted. <sighs> so BitMax for a while now has had a partnership with Chainalysis. And given their current situation, are now um, integrating that even more deeply by pulling in Chainalysis's Know Your Transaction screening capabilities to integrate into BitMEX's system. So pretty much my takeaway here is that they were probably doing something previous like just looking back a hop or two for explicitly tainted or stolen coins and things such as that. Um, and yeah, they're going to probably start scrutinizing things a lot more. So yeah. Um, damn it. This place used to be the bastion of fuck KYC 
of you are an adult and you can decide what dumb shit to do yourself. Um, here you go. Send over your Bitcoin. And now it is just turning into the exact opposite of that. And it makes me very sad. Very, very sad. This is your reminder that trusted third parties are chain analysis buttholes. Yep. And the fun thing is, uh, I wonder how many people who were not in America or um, illegal jurisdictions uh, who just kept trading on BitMEX and now that they are a KYC platform have all kinds of nice information that can be put together now that previously couldn't. Mm -hmm. So pour yet another drink out for BitMEX further cucking itself again and be sad. All right. All right. So more regulated things are here. Anchorage Ew. Digital. Hmm. So this is a uh, custodian um, slash lending um, slash trading platform um, with investors such as Visa, Polychain, and Dreesen Horowitz, uh, Blockchain Capital, and so on. And they have been granted the first OCC um, federal um, approval for a national trust charter. So this is officially the first entity that can custody cryptocurrency um, anywhere in the United States um, without having to worry about all the state by state nonsense because they now have a federal uh, trust charter. And interesting thing I saw um, from Caitlin Long because uh, a bunch of people were kind of asking what this meant for um, the project going on in Wyoming. And there is really only one major distinction um, from everything she put together into a thread in the show notes uh, between um, Avanti and Anchorage. And that's effectively that the trust charter that Anchorage has just been granted um, does not allow them to hook into the Fed's payment system um, with Fedwire because they can't actually take deposits. Um, and now that, that might seem kind of confusing um, given that they're a custodian, but the, the key distinction here is as a trust, um, you know, when they're custodying your Bitcoin for you, that's that's not a customer deposit on their balance sheet. That is them with the obligation to custody that for you. Um, and only deposit taking institutions can actually plug into Fedwire. So, yeah, um, pretty much what I think is going to happen here is Anchorage is going to wind up being a big custodian for hedge funds, trading desks, institutions that require that type of thing. But I don't think um, based on Caitlin's take that they can really by any means try to do the, the types of things that Avanti and uh, Kraken are doing in, in terms of actually making a bank bank that can actually interact with and uh, handle crypto stuff. So pretty big news in terms of, uh, you know, the regulatory landscape of w where do these big wigs put their crypto when they get their hands on it, but by no means something that is going to jump up like Avanti and um, try to be your bank that speaks Bitcoin. I'm surprised they didn't try to take the name Chain Anchorage. Hmm. Would have been more fitting for the space. But yeah, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see how uh, how big Anchor Anchorage's um, reserves of stuff under custody get compared to the different corporate treasuries um, pulling stuff on their sheets or things like Grayscale. Aside from that, um, yawn. Well... In some cooler news, 
Uh, I've been covering the grants from the Human Rights Foundation for privacy-related developments in Bitcoin in my newsletter. And on January 12th, they announced that they were doing another round of grants, uh, each worth uh, $25,000 to Ben Kaufman for Spectre Wallet, uh, which is a watch-only wallet that runs with Bitcoin Core and can also work with hardware wallets, as far as I know. Uh, and the other recipient is the Global Mesh Labs team, including Richard Myers, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this person's name, and Will Clark. Shinobi, do you know how to pronounce the name? Fode Diap? I do not. Anyway, they work on a project called Lot49. Um, as Bitcoin Magazine described it, it's a Android application that adapts Bitcoin and Lightning Network implementation implementations to serve regions with low and intermittent internet connectivity. And in this case, uh, they haven't done this with all the grants, but in this case, um, HRF revealed that the major donor in this case was the Winklevi twins, or at least Gemini, which is run by the Winklevi. Very interesting. But yeah, I, I, I'm like really happy to see where the Human Rights Foundation has been taking all these grants, because like Spectre has kind of just exploded into a huge wallet that everybody's using all over the place for multi-sig stuff. So on that front, it's absolutely nice to see uh, the maintainer get a grant for that because, you know, it's kind of untenable when things just explode because somebody's building it in their free time and then it becomes a massive tool everybody's using and then are you sure he can afford to keep maintaining it? And then, yeah, you know, I am actually, I, I did not see the part about the Winklevi twins or Gemini donating to Lot 49. Um, that is really interesting to see them funding like monetized mesh network designs. That's kind of a huge stark contrast um, with a lot of the other things they say and do in the space. Mm hmm. <laughs> like Gemini itself. I just keep thinking back to like all their ad campaigns about like we're regulated. So that means we're safe. And now you throw money at a monetized onion routed mesh network. What? We are men of Harvard. Harvard is squeaky clean, right, Shinobi? I'm sorry. I can't answer I that. I don't want to go to the gulag. But yeah. That's where Facebook was born. Which, as everyone should know by now, was originally created as a way for Mark Zuckerberg to rate the hotness of women on campus. Again, and no now, comment. And now it is still used for that purpose, but the difference is you join voluntarily, and then you can get harassed by them too. And it tracks you everywhere you browse on the web too. Yeah. Well... I think I can succinctly say, um, fuck the Winklevoss twins, but thank you for throwing money at something. Yeah, Bitcoin billionaires. All right, so that puts us down to the last two. So I guess really quick, but really awesome um, new firmware update for the cold card. Um, they have updated the address explorer that allows you to verify receive addresses on the device itself um, to support sub accounts with account numbers um, to allow entering custom derivation paths um, switched the export format from a text file to a csv if you use the sd card for that and also added support for multi-sig addresses um, and for this feature they are blanking out some characters um, in showing the address on screen um, so that you don't use that to actually receive money directly off the cold card and i'm assuming that the safety reasoning there has to do with um you know making sure that what your multi-sig file on your device has is the correct address that would actually be spendable um, 
but this will allow you now to um, throw up your software wallet, look at your multi-sig address you're sending money to, and verify that your cold card is um, displaying the correct address for that um, compared to your software wallet. So that is a huge awesome change and um, definitely a big safety improvement for using multisig if you are the type of person paranoid about address swapping attacks and things like that. Mm -hmm. All right, and I guess last one. Um, this is really kind of fucking hilarious to me. <laughs> so Tether uses a bank in the Bahamas called Deltec. Um, Deltec just recently announced that they invested some customers' funds and deposits into Bitcoin. The internet ran completely wild with how, see, we told you Tether is backed by Bitcoin, not dollars. And before the internet started screaming about this narrative, all the, the Tether things we've said for years are true, see? Not a single person thought to figure out whether the customer funds that Deltec invested in Bitcoin have anything to do with Tether's funds that they're custodying. They don't. Tether maintains complete control over what their funds are invested in, held as, um, yada yada, so on and so forth. And none of the funds that Deltec invested in Bitcoin have anything to do with Tether's funds. So, yeah, let's let's give a a golf clap here for how quick the internet runs away with any little sentence that it can find somewhere to reinforce a narrative they already decided was true instead of actually spend five seconds asking questions. Golf clap. Well, even worse wasn't this an entire Coindesk article? Yep. Journalism. Which brings me to my final thought, if we're ready for that. We are. So, um, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, how should I put this? Glenn Greenwald's, uh, leave from The Intercept was pretty public, and that's basically how he spearheaded his new venture as a independent writer on Substack. Um, and that was d December, November, I can't remember exactly anymore, it feels quite long ago now, but uh, on January 14th, um, Laura Poitras published a letter saying that as of November 30th, 2020, which was around the same time as Glenn Greenwald, uh, she was fired from First Look Media, which is an organization that she co-founded. And she says, my termination came two months after I spoke to the press about the Intercept's failure to protect whistleblower reality winner and the cover-up and lack of accountability that followed. And after years of raising concerns internally about patterns of discrimination and retaliation, I was told my firing was effective immediately and without cause, my access to email was shut down and that the company had no plans to communicate my abrupt determination to the public. First Look Media and The Intercept were founded upon Edward Snowden's whistleblowing and the investigative journalism that Glenn Greenwald and I all risked our lives to bring to the public, exposing the National Security Agency's illegal global mass surveillance programs. Um, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but you may remember that they, The Intercept, without input from Laura, um or Edward Snowden even, they decided to close the Snowden archive. Um, the reason given being that it cost too much money, which made no sense because as many people pointed out, it was a tiny, tiny fraction of the budget. And also the intercept is funded by a billionaire. So citing money as the reason is not believable in the slightest. But yeah, so basically now the two major co-founders of First Look Media slash The Intercept have gone now, um, which is like, I don't know how they're going to keep going from this point because 
the entire reason it was created, as she said in her letter, it was to get and publish Edward Snowden's documents uh, that he risked his life to publish um, through journalists like Laura and Glenn and others uh, through The Intercept. And so, yeah, um, this is awful. But also, I'm kind of wondering how, like, I don't know, I feel like it was a monumental mistake to co-found an organization that you then are not the head of. Um, because as she points out, the editor-in-chief is Betsy Reed, and the CEO is Michael Bloom. And Betsy Reed, I, I know a little bit more about, but Michael Bloom, I basically know very little about other than that he's a CEO of The Intercept. Uh, before The Intercept, I'd never heard his name before. Maybe that's just because I just am stupid and maybe he's a big name person, but I've never heard of him. I never got the impression that he was a person who was nearly as much concerned about the kinds of topics that they were. So I think it was a monumental mistake for these two people to basically be made the head of the organization that they founded, because I feel like, especially with the topics that they were covering, that something like this was bound to happen, especially if you're getting paid by a billionaire who also has extreme financial interests in Amazon, which is running infrastructure for the Central Intelligence Agency and probably a bunch of other government agencies. So... I I mean, pretty sure I should have seen this coming, but also as a person who was and has been subject to basically being let go without being given any cause, uh, I can at least sympathize with uh, the fact that that sucks. Um, and who knows what the real reason is for why she was turned terminated um they're not really talking about it but i feel like it has something to do with uh you know just they were not willing to actually challenge the national security agencies anymore yep sounds about right to me well um so yeah um my final thought was just going to be um how hilarious it was that the IMF um, published a poll on Twitter asking if cryptocurrencies are really money. Now, mm -hmm. yeah, 79% of 95,000 people said yes. I just noticed scrolling through their timeline to go find that tweet to get the correct percentages that they just made another poll today. Are central bank digital currencies really money? Um, there's 19 <laughs> hours left and 13,000 people have voted so far. So far, 53% say no. <laughs> I, I, I can almost imagine their their faces like they thought they were going to make an absolute dunk because like, yeah, of course, a majority of people are probably going to say it's not money. Oh, shit. Well, wait. So if we want to do a CBDC, what, you know, guys, come on, give us some votes like. <laughs> yep. I'm not sure that guy's going to be managing that Twitter account much longer. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, you know, like if, as a person who has managed social media before, uh, I would be shocked if that kind of thing was not something that was at least discussed in the marketing communications team or whatever, or something of the IMF. Like if one guy just like, yeah, I'm going to do a poll that's just going to completely undermine my employer. <laughs> Um, that would be amazing. That is like Bitcoin sign guy equivalent uh, takedown. Well, either subterfuge, either the Twitter account handler or the guy whose idea that poll was 
probably uh, not too happy right now. But yeah, guess any any more final thoughts, final jokes? Uh, well, given that this is a final thought, I didn't check which episodes I talked about this in, but I have in the past talked about plaid and the class action lawsuits that are as far as i know still ongoing i have been able to find very little information with updates on what's happening with them they may have even stalled because of the pandemic situation in the u.s but one update that i can give is that there was also an antitrust lawsuit that the justice department filed against visa saying that they should not acquire plaid um, which they had announced that they would do so last year for $5.3 billion. And some of you would be like, why would, what kind of startup do you acquire for $5.3 billion? Well, Plaid uh, is valuable to Visa because it is the service that a lot of financial applications used to connect to bank accounts. And in the process of doing so, uh, because they kind of get credentials for your bank account, they have been scraping a lot of them for as much information as possible, so they know pretty much everything about you that can be learned from your bank account, which is a lot, and they brag about this. They have been bragging about this for years. Um, yeah, uh, so it's basically a data merger at the end of the day, and because that antitrust lawsuit was launched, Visa recently announced that they are actually calling off the merger with Plaid. So $5.3 billion just went bye-bye for Plaid, which is good news to me. Yeah, I mean, we'll see how that goes. I, I saw somebody somewhere on Twitter speculating that maybe Plaid was just kind of playing games to create a valuation out of this and then um not go through with things well either way um it is a good thing if visa and plaid are not working together because that basically means that i mean visa already is a in a monopolist position in terms of payment networks um but yeah, Plaid, I mean, I definitely recommend reading, I can't remember, because there was a number of class action lawsuits, actually, I don't know which one this had it, and, but there was one document in particular that they kind of went through the history of Plaid's founders and statements that they've made on, you know, podcasts or tech conferences or shows or what have you and some of the things they said are really not cool in terms of privacy yep well i'm all plumbed out same but if you want to hear me talk more about privacy i will be doing that on i believe saturday saturday no sunday sunday Saturday or, yeah, Saturday the 23rd, so next weekend, I will be giving a talk on privacy, although I'm not sure how many people, uh, I ha I can't recall, but I it's for the Chicago Bob meetup. I don't know if, if a lot more people than just the Bob meetup attendees join if they're going to work with that, but maybe, yeah, if you're in Chicago, you're in luck. Mm-hmm. Check it out if you can, punks. And I hope you enjoyed the episode today. Adios. Bye. <laughs>